Mark Skousen, Editor-in-Chief of Forecast and Strategies, joins us today to talk about Biden's proposed $6 trillion budget as well as the jobs report that came out this morning. Mark, welcome back. Good to be back. It looks like blue is the thing to be in. I'm blue and you have a blue background. <laughs> <laughs> This is a color coordination by coincidence, not by design, of course. Mark, you are an esteemed economist. You're, um, you're, uh, you're a professor uh, at Chapman University. I wanted to bring, your, bring you in to talk about uh, macro and what's going on right now, specifically in regards to the in, uh, unemployment rate. Uh, it's gone down to 5.8% in the latest reading that came out just this morning. It's the lowest level since the start of the pandemic. How are you interpreting this? Are you optimistic now that the unemployment has gone down lower. Now, remember, of course, 559,000 jobs were added, but it still missed estimates of around 675,000. Yeah, I think actually this is a deliberate policy by the Biden administration to encourage labor shortages and to actually, uh, the reason uh, the federal government is offering these very generous uh, unemployment uh, compensation of $300 a week and so forth is to force worker, uh, force employees, empl I'm sorry, employers and firms to raise wages. You know, they, they had a big push to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour and that's not getting through Congress. So indirectly, they're getting the $15 wage increase uh, by uh, the labor shortages and by forcing uh, employers to have to provide higher wages, more benefits, whatever it takes to get people to, uh, to get back to work. And uh, so I think it's a very clever, uh, sneaky way to raise wages. That, and so the unemployment rate is down to 5.8% and uh, the number of uh, new job creation is relatively slow. Uh, so they, that will just uh, encourage more wage increases, more bonuses, everything they can do to help the uh, the union workers. They're they're very, very pro union, so I think that there is a uh, method to their madness, if you will. Uh, but the uh, other side, of it, it's going to cause higher inflation and eventually higher interest rates. So. That's the negative side of this policy, uh, higher labor costs, uh, shortages in uh, uh, a variety of products, uh, oil, higher, higher energy prices. There's lots of higher food prices. This is all causing inflation to move higher and eventually will cause interest rates to rise. Okay, uh, Mark, you mentioned that there's a shortage of labor. How, how is that possible right now? We're still at you know, above pre-pandemic uh, levels of unemployment, there's still, I think, 6.7 million or close to 7 million people unemployed. It's going to take roughly a year, people estimate, before we bring it back down to pre-COVID levels. So uh, wh wh where is the shortage? How can we observe this? Yeah, it's in job openings. Job openings are increasing dramatically. They just can't find the workers. And the reason they can't find the workers is because they're sitting at home collecting these uh, checks from the state and federal governments. And so they lack the incentive to go back to work. So employers have to raise wages. They're offering bonuses like $500 if you sign here. I mean, it's like, like baseball players or sports figures. Uh, and uh, I think it's I think it's a deliberate policy. I really do to get uh, a, a work around the uh, um, the minimum wage legislation that's uh, being stalled in Congress. I think you're I think something interesting that might support your theory is that I think the labor force participation rate went down. I was reading that the labor force participation rate uh, went down as well. So uh, for the viewers out there, that 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 reading basically indicates how many people are in the labor force. So the unemployment rate is calculated using that pool of people. So why is it that people are not putting themselves in the labor force as much as before? Is that, is that, is that, is that because of the unemployment, uh, $300 a week unemployment checks? Yeah, I think that's basically what's happening here. Uh, and there's also a disconnect a little bit between training and ability and what is in demand right now. I mean, engineer, demand for engineering, demand for technology, 
demands in finance and so forth, these are rising rather dramatically and you may not have the uh, skills uh, available. So there may be a disconnect there as well. But the unemployment rate uh, of 5.8% going down sounds like a really good statistic, but all it is reflecting is uh, people looking for jobs and if the uh, labor uh, participation rate is dropping, that suggests that people are dropping out because they, they aren't looking for a job. And why should they look for a job when they get paid more to sit at home than they do working uh, for a company and have to pay taxes and that sort of thing? So uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a terrible policy. And this is why so many state governments are are now reneging on the $300 a week payments, basically trying to force people to get back to work. Uh, you know, the, the Republicans in the Senate have been trying to repeal this $300 a week uh, unemployment uh, check for quite a few months now. Are they making any progress? Are they, uh, is that, is that going to happen or do you, do you think that's just going to be a gridlock? Yeah, no, it's the House that that's uh, in control by the uh, by the Democrats and by Nancy Pelosi, and they seem to be uh, all together on this issue. No, it's on the state level that they're withholding. They're they're basically saying uh, no more three hundred dollar a week checks and get back to work. Okay, now do you think that uh, that okay? So you, you're theorizing that Biden's policy is deliberately causing a shortage, so wages would go up. Um, are we observing wage pressures right now? Do you think it's happening right now or do you think it's happening sometime down the line? Oh no, it's happening right now. Uh, we're seeing more companies uh, raising the minimum wage even beyond $15 a, a, an hour. And uh, so I think these statistics will start sh coming out in the next few months. And it's going to force uh, companies to raise prices uh, the demand is there. All the all the uh, free money that the federal government is uh, putting out there is resulting in higher demand for goods and services, for food, for energy, and so forth. The economy is getting back in terms of activity, in terms of consumer consumption is uh, is rising, uh, but but uh, job job. Uh, uh, the job market is where the disequilibrium is taking place. And uh, it's uh, until people really get back to work, uh, I think we're seeing uh, more money chasing fewer goods. I actually see a period of stagflation that is developing. Uh, even the Biden administration in their $6 trillion budget are assuming that it will result in a 1.8 real economic growth rate, GMP, real GDP rising on average over the next three years of 1.8%. Well, that's even less than what the Trump administration uh, economic growth rate was, which was over 2%. So uh, that suggests a rather slow growth in environment. And you're certainly going to get it with all the emphasis of uh, uh, in the budget toward uh, uh, green jobs and uh, green energy, which is uh, highly inefficient in this marketplace. And just throwing money at uh, child care, universal child care, uh, higher uh, uh, unemployment compensation, a lot of things where you're not getting anything really productive out of it. And so we're entering a slow growth policy and we're also entering a higher inflation policy. So that is the beginning of a 1970s kind of environment of stagflation. So that's my prediction uh, for uh, in the future. And I think the stock market is going to struggle as a result of that. Uh, and uh, people are going to have to be more selective in their stocks to make money. Okay, we're going to talk about stock markets and your investments uh, uh, later on. But let's, let's talk about the budget now because you brought it up. Six trillion dollars is what... Biden is proposing, and uh, it's already come out. He's speaking about it today on Friday. Now, $6 trillion is the largest on record in terms of GDP. It's also the largest since World War II. 
It's broken down by the American Jobs Plan, which is more infrastructure focused, and then the American Enough uh, Families Plan, which is more healthcare, social security focused, and insurance as well. So uh, l- let's break this down here. Infrastructure spending, is it necessary right now? How are we going to finance it? Where is the money going to come from? What is the net impact on people's wallets is what the ordinary person wants to, wants to know. Well, I certainly agree that infrastructure is a serious problem in the United States. Uh, like you, David, I've traveled, I've been to 77 countries, and I can tell you that the United States in terms of infrastructure is third world in many ways. I mean, our airports, our highways, our uh, the potholes in New York City, uh, the bridges, uh, the, the plumbing systems, our, our grid, our electric grid. I mean, all of this needs upgrading, and it's going to cost billions, of, if not trillions of dollars. Uh, the so-called infrastructure bill is a is a joke. Only like five or six percent is actually devoted toward infrastructure uh, and construction and improvement of our roads and and highways and airports and that sort of thing. So uh, that is rest not an to? infrastructure bill, huh? Well, where's the rest going to be spent on? Well, the rest is spent on the other things that you mentioned uh, of uh, healthcare and green green energy. And uh, universal child care. I mean, there's all kinds of other programs in there that uh, are not related in any way to infrastructure. Um, so I would like to see money spent on infrastructure. You say, how should it be financed? Well, it should be financed privately. There's no reason why airports and sports stadiums and and roads and stuff can't be uh, taken care of uh, in, privately or, or certainly outsourced so that the government's not doing it. And that's generally the way they do it. Um, but the federal government doesn't have to be so much involved as the states. It's really the states and local authorities and private industry that is engaged in infrastructure investments, uh, not necessarily the federal government. So there's there's a definite mistake here in having the federal government involved. And it's all deficit spending anyway. I mean, we're talking about, uh, uh, they're estimating $1.8 trillion deficit because they have a huge tax increase. Remember, don't forget that this trillion dollar, $6 trillion budget includes three three trillion dollars in uh, tax increases over a 10 period. And we're seeing dramatic increases in attacks on wealthy and the entrepreneurs, the elimination of the long-term capital gains exemption so that uh, investors are gonna pay 40, 50, and sometimes 60% when they sell a stock or real estate. I mean, how, in, how stupid is that? I don't, think, I don't think this is going to pass. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Biden has already said he will not raise the corporate income tax from 21 percent to 26 percent if the Republicans agree to uh, a, a higher level of uh, infrastructure, uh, the infrastructure budget. So, so that may be in the office, but you can see Biden is already having to back off it, uh, the tax increases. Well, hold up. Let, let's let's talk about taxes. That's important because I'm looking at the uh, proposal for the budget here. Now, it looks yeah, 1.8 trillion dollars is the proposed deficit for the following year, but it's it goes down, in, you know, after that 1.3, 1.4. So, uh, listen to this in the budget proposal. It says over time savings from these reforms, and it's talking about tax reforms, would exceed the cost of the investments. And by large and growing amounts, the American Jobs Plan and the American Families Plan together are paid for over 15 years. The full set of proposals in the budget reduce the annual deficit by the end of the 10-year budget window and uh, every year after. And this, these are the reforms that the, uh, that the budget is talking about. The budget achieves this through reforms to the tax system. The budget provides reforms to the corporate tax code to incentivize job creation and investment in the United States, stopping unfair and wasteful profit shifting to tax havens, ensure that large corporations are paying their fair share and stop a race to the bottom of corporate taxes around the world. It sounds to me like Biden wants to pay for this budget deficit by raising corporate taxes. Is that what's going on? Uh, You know, I have a a more historical approach to this. If you look at Hong Kong, which has one of the highest uh, uh, growth rates Uh, prior to the Chinese trying to take over Hong Kong in the last year or so. Uh, 
you remember the last time they changed their tax law? You want to guess? No, no, I, I don't think I was born yet. <laughs> yeah, it was back in the 1950s. Okay, the 1950s. definitely wasn't around. <laughs> and, and they have a flat tax of 16.5%. They have no tax on capital gains, interest, or dividends. So investors can move the capital around wherever they want. It's the most efficient use of capital imaginable. So it's a very simple tax system. And they don't change it every couple of years. They don't change it every time a new president comes in. And this is the great tragedy of American democracy, is that we're constantly changing the tax laws. And this is great. You know, these are, these are tax legislation that benefit accountants and uh, and and tax uh, tax accountants, uh, these are the people who benefited from this kind of a system. And it's a, you know, if you want real reform, then you need to have a straight flat tax. It's very simple, and you don't want to change it every couple of years. It's got to be the same. I don't give much hope in that, but I look at a Chapman University. I teach the theory of tax, and we are so far removed from a rational tax policy. And one of it has to be dependability. Businesses need to decide. So the corporate tax rate is at 21%. Keep the rate at 21%. Don't keep moving it around. I mean, Canada has had a flat tax of what, 12% on corporate on corporations. Isn't it 12% or 15%, something like that? And it's been that way since, since the late 90s. Why can't we just maintain a stable rate so that businesses can make their decisions knowing that the tax rate isn't going to change every year. And especially, there's no reason for taxes to rise dramatically on investors. How are you supposed to switch from one, uh, one stock to another, from one piece of real estate to another for a more effect effective use of your money if you know you're going to have to send half of it to the U.S. government, and you're never going to see that again. That will deter people from selling stocks, from selling real estate uh, when they, uh, it goes, con it's, it's contrary to everything that's, that we stand for. Now, it also says the plan would eliminate long-standing loopholes, including lower taxes on capital gains and dividends for the wealthy, which reward wealth over work. So corporate taxes, now, by the way, um, they, they, they've, they've, They've talked about raising corporate taxes in the U.S., but they've also talked about encouraging other nations in the G20 to raise their corporate taxes as well. So uh, like they say here, there's a race to the bottom. They, they, they discourage that. Um, so not only is the United States thinking of raising corporate taxes, but they're thinking of encouraging their partners around the world to do the same. Um, also, capital gains taxes domestically. So we've got an increase of corporate taxes potentially worldwide, plus an increase in capital gains taxes. What's going to happen in the markets? How are investors going to react? Well, it's certainly going to hurt liquidity. Why would anyone sell? They're going to hold off and wait until the tax rate goes back down. The Republicans are probably going to take this the House uh, in two years, uh, the, maybe keep the Senate uh, in, in two more years if they get a decent president uh, for the Republicans, like uh, Governor DeSantis from Florida, uh, then we're going to go back to a lower tax policy without all the antics of a Trump. Uh, and I think that'll be very good for the country and good for investors. But if investors are faced with a 40 to 60 percent capital gains tax rate, what do you think? I mean, that is a that is a huge deterrent for uh, investing in the marketplace. Now, if you're inside your uh, tax deferred vehicle, an IRA or uh, or a KEO or a SEP, uh, you're okay for now. Uh, required minimum distribution, that's a serious problem. Uh, RMDs, where you're forced to take money out of your IRA, this is an extremely negative policy. Look, it's all about capital. A tax on capital gains is a tax on capital. Cap a tax on corporations is a tax on capital. Uh, a tax on uh, higher income on wealthy individuals, income tax is a tax on capital because wealthy people tend to save more. A tax on interest and dividends is a tax on capital. And it's capital that drives the economy and makes it grow and keeps interest rates down. So why would you constantly be attacking uh, the source of prosperity in this country, which is capital? Mm -hmm. 
All right. Well, speaking of prosperity and sources of capital, you talked about the stock market earlier, and you talked about preferred sectors that need to be picked very carefully in this environment. Can you tell us what these preferred sectors are and what you like to invest in right now? I'm very much a, a value investor finally coming into uh, its own after 10 years of being under performance. So fundamentals favor value investing. I like private equity companies like Main Street Capital, symbol M-A-I-N. Omega Healthcare Investors, O-H-I is the symbol, which invests in nursing homes. Uh, Enterprise Products Partners, EPD, is a um, Houston-based pipeline and energy storage company. All of these are yielding 6 or 7%. They're all up moving very nicely this year after being uh, hit fairly hard over the years. You know, energy stocks, look at Exxon uh, Mobil, stock that's up 50% this year. We've done really well with Exxon Mobil, uh, even though it's not green energy uh, at all. Uh, the, the green stocks have really not done that particularly that well. So I'm a value investor and I'm looking for value type investors that uh, investments, technology stocks are so overvalued right now. We're in them, but uh, we're emphasizing value investing, high income stocks. Uh, to me, that's that's the place to go. You know, it's not a stock market. It's a market of stocks and you have to be selective these days. OK. And finally, Mark, you are the organizer of Freedom Fest. Uh, we've talked about this before, but it's coming up. It's Almost, uh, we're almost close to launch date, conference date. So we've got 3,000 attendees so far, you've told me offline, South Dakota. Great event, big event. Can you give us a teaser on the agenda? Yes, I could. So uh, Freedom Fest is the name of the event. We have it every year normally in Las Vegas, but after the uh, Nevada authorities shut us down, we decided to move for the first time to uh, uh, Rapid City South uh, Dakota, which is a very open state, and uh, w the response has been tremendous. Our theme is life. Uh, our, our theme is healthy, wealthy, and wise, and we think that's a really important theme after the COVID pandemic, and we, we have Dr. Drew coming. We have Senator Mike Lee coming. We have Hershey uh, Ali, Ian Hershey Ali, who is the uh, former Muslim uh, speaking, we love supply side economists, Steve Moore, uh, John Fine over Norquist uh, speaking, uh, John John Mackey, the CEO of Whole Foods Markets. We have over 200 speakers. We're just delighted to be in South Dakota and it'll be July 21st through the 24th. And uh, people are driving, flying, RVing, uh, biking, whatever it takes to get there. And uh, if you go to freedomfest.com, you can read all about all our, our special events. We have a film festival, the Anthem Film Festival, celebrating their 10th year. We have a full three-day investment conference with Rob Arnott. And uh, we have Larry Arn, who, who's just the president of Hillsdale College. So anyway, if you, if you go to our website, freedomfest.com, you'll see we're, we're doing a, a great show there. And we're really excited to have uh, Kitco TV coming to cover us, as well as Newsmax TV and C-SPAN. So we're having a lot of media coverage as well. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, we're looking forward to being there and covering the event. Thank you very much for the invitation. And thank you for coming on the show today, Mark. Great updates as usual. I look forward to speaking with you soon. Thank you again, David. And thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lynn.